Good noontide from sunny Honolulu, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome one and all. You know, the world is facing a myriad of problems. We have Ukraine, we have Gaza, we have starvation in Africa, but people who have really studied the issue know that there is an 800 pound gorilla above all the problems, and that is climate change. It is already affecting us, costing us billions of dollars. It'll probably cost us trillions of dollars down the road. And thank goodness we have young leaders emerging who are going to focus on solving the climate change problems. We have with us today, Rena Camario and Mira Fujii of the Climate Change Forum. And I'm not going to go into any more. I'm going to let these wonderful high school students take it away from here. So, Mira, I believe you're going to do the introductions and the explanations. Yes. Hi, my name is Mira. Um, I was the uh, Climate Justice Policy Area Leader for the Climate Future Forum this past uh, December. So this past December, we had the Climate Future Forum. So we brought in um, a bunch of high school students along with policymakers and other organizations. And we all kind of gathered together and um, focusing on different areas like regenerative food systems and clean energy and transportation. And our um, group was um, focusing on climate justice and human rights. So in our group this past year, we um, talked a lot about what climate justice means to us and um, kind of uh, like our priorities in this area specifically. And we did talk a lot about um, education and finding ways to um, bring climate, um, climate change education into um, legislation and just encouraging more education on climate cl climate change in order to um, further climate justice. Um, um, one of the th other things that we did focus on as well was um, with the Navahine trials. This um, that happened earlier and um, other aims or like lawsuits or uh, legislation that is focusing on uh, bringing more awareness to climate change and ensuring that all people all um, of all socioeconomic status can um, receive the benefits of fighting climate change. So, yeah. Aloha, everyone. My name is Reina. I first became involved in climate activism this past year when I joined the Hawaii Youth Climate Coalition. Last year, I also had the chance to serve as one of the youth organizers of the Climate Future Forum. And this year I was honored to serve as one of the co-chairs for our climate justice working group. So as Mira touched on, a large part of our working group discussion was focused around the idea of what is climate justice. There are, we, we, dis, we determined there are several avenues through which you can approach this concept. Um, the, the precise technical definitions from the UN Development Program is, quote, climate justice means putting equity and human rights at the core of decision making and action on climate change, end quote. Basically, the societal or human side of the actions we take to combat climate change. And we also decided that climate justice also means approaching climate change through the courts. So, for example, as Mira mentioned, the Navahine versus Hawaii Department of Transportation trial just this past April marks uh, one of the, our, the first efforts among youth to kind of push for climate justice in, in the courts. And Howard, as a matter of fact, we were, were wondering uh, what, what, what would be your take on this notion of climate justice? Okay. I like to give examples instead of speaking abstractly. So I'll give an example of something I'm working on, namely the urban heat island effect, where if you have a rural area and in a suburban area and in an urban area and measure the temperature, you will find that the temperature goes up and up when 
it's concentrated in the urban area. And then within the urban area and suburbia, you have some stark differences in temperature. And I'm thinking of Hawaii as a, a, a very warm climate in the wealthy suburbs with plenty of trees or in the nice areas of town, again, with plenty of trees, you are cool and comfortable. Where the less fortunate people live, generally there is a lack of trees and a concentration of solar radiation, which we experience as heat. Something we're doing to mitigate that is cool roofs, cool walls, and so forth to reflect the heat back up. That's one example. People live in hotter, more uncomfortable climates when they are of the poorer status. Another stark example is, say, Louisiana, which has a lot of oil refineries. And guess, oh, and they are just polluting as heck, the plumes from those refineries. Guess who lives in the shadows of those refineries? Poor people. And of course, they have the resulting respiratory illnesses and generally a shorter uh, lifespan because of that. Uh, final example, there are several different suburbs in Washington, D.C. In one suburb, there is a concentration of very wealthy people. The average lifespan is 93 years old. Then you go a few other neighborhoods down concentrate very poor people, the average lifespan is 67 years old. It's those type of problems when we're thinking of climate justice that, that we need to uh, alleviate. Absolutely. It definitely seems to be a pattern that we leave out people of lower economic status or people who don't have the same resources as us. And in fact, one of the concrete examples I thought of during our working group is the problem of eco-ableism. So even when we're determining legislation towards combating climate change, we often neglect this large portion of the large portion of disabled people within our community and forget to encompass them within all the preventative and uh, protective measures we take. So in all of that, we talked about the need for a just transition and ensuring that in our process of combating climate change, we don't leave anyone behind and make sure that all of our interests are represented. This is part of a much larger problem that we're seeing, not in just in Hawaii, not just in the US, but worldwide. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and the poor are living in worse and worse and worse environmental conditions, whereas those of us who are among the, the fortunate, we're just comfortable as anything. So I'll pro proceed, didn't mean to interrupt you there. I think we wanted to also make sure that um, when we're creating legislation that we're um, not placing an unfair burden on um, people who are on of socio lower socioeconomic statuses. So I think when we're considering a lot of this legislation, we wanna make sure that um, we're not just making the uh, uh, less fortunate people pay for our problems and um, ensure that, yeah, that gap doesn't um, widen even more. So um, I think Raina was gonna talk about one of our, uh, the legislation that we were uh, talking about in our groups. Right, so one concrete piece of legislation we all determined is crucial to climate justice is this idea of carbon cashback. Now, unfortunately, uh, the carbon cashback bill of this year has been deferred by the Agricultural and Environment Committee, I think, and the e Energy, Economic Development and Tourism Committee. So it looks like it won't make much more headway this year, but it's something we're hoping will certainly resurface in the coming years. So in any case, carbon cashback, as stated here, is part of SB number 2525 and establishes a carbon barrel tax system in which proceeds are distributed among all Hawaii residents. So that applies to you even if you're on the wealthy side or on the poorer side. And what's special about this program is that it will target, it will deliberately target low income residents. A quote here says that quote, the 20% of households with lowest incomes would gain more than $1,000. So alongside combating climate change, what carbon cashback really does is ensure 
that we're not leaving anyone behind economically. Yeah, that, that's going to raise the the price of uh, oil and price, and price of gasoline. Did you people Absolutely. actually get to the Capitol and sit in the hearing rooms and and testify and listen to the other people testifying? Yeah, I think a lot of more uh, youth have made efforts to go directly to the Capitol, mm -hmm. and especially mm -hmm. with Zoom testimony these days, it's become a lot easier to express our voices. Yeah, good, good, good. That's a tremendous experience. Yeah, Absolutely. And what more do you have for us? Um, so another one of the bills that we were um, talked about that we think is important uh, during our session um, was the climate impact fee, which uh, used to be called the green fee, I believe, but um, it wasn't um, passed last, um, last, last session. So this year it's being called the climate impact fee. And um, this one, I think it was proposed by our governor, Josh Green. And it's a $25 fee, but the exact price of it has kind of changed as it's gone on. But it's basically a fee that would um, be charged to visitors who stay in hotels or vacation rentals. And it would um, create a fund um, and a a new kind of, yeah, a new fund and a, a program to implement those funds to go to different um, go into uh, reducing climate change impacts, such as um, I think a lot of emphasis has been put onto the Lahaina wildfires and also addressing um, flooding, pollution, um, uh, other shoreline issues and things like that. So this would kind of uh, create like a new kind of way to uh, put money back into our our, our own land and um, I guess take some of the resources from our uh, and the I guess some of the damage caused by our uh, 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 tourism uh, department. So I think we thought that this uh, bill was really important because it would provide a way to fund these projects like mm -hmm. um, uh, I like all the clim reducing climate change impacts, like the fires, the flooding, all of that, but in a way that would not, uh, I guess, take more uh, money or taxes from the local population in Hawaii. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, in fact, those a lot of those dollars would have uh, created more jobs, maybe, and including environmental jobs, perhaps. Yes, yes, that yeah. would be ideal. Mm. So on to the next slide. During our workshop, we also touched on the idea of research and how important it is to kind of focus our efforts on this somewhat neglected area of climate research. And when you think of climate research, you probably think of scientific or technological research, but we think it's equally as important to place emphasis on the societal implications of that research and of our efforts in combating climate change. So some bills we've pointed out here are SB number 657 and HB 441. And these are companion bills. They create a database of research included in a climate justice report, specifically on the social vulnerability to climate change. So it focuses on things like the income gap and uh, data indicators. So it's based in empirical evidence, and it's at least finally shedding some light on what we can do on the human side of climate change to mitigate the impacts of, of our efforts in combating climate change. Mm -hmm. And some core questions at, at the base of this issue are that of which groups are the most vulnerable and how do we ensure a just transition? How do we ensure a transition to a sustainable future without leaving anyone behind, whether that be you know, in the job market or members of the disabled community, as I was talking about earlier. Howard, if you have any input on either of these questions, we'd love to hear it. Well, uh, President Biden pushed through the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, which in fact is very, very environmentally oriented, and it has attached to it hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars 
And I was at a conference in Atlanta not long ago, sponsored by the Environmental Protection Agency. And the big push there was for heat pump water heaters. I don't know if you've ever heard of those, but those are air conditioners in reverse, which create hot water in a much more efficient manner than do your conventional old fashioned water heaters, where they are up to four and four and a half times as efficient. And in low income homes, very often, well, low income homes usually have a lot of people under one roof. The more people you have under that roof, the more hot water you're going to be consuming. And water heating can account for 40% of the utility bill of a, a lower income home. The use of the federal funds, the IRA funds, would engage the manufacturers of heat pump water heaters to get into the lower income neighborhoods and sit down, you meet with community leaders so they gain trust and then sit down with the individual homeowners and say, we can take out this old water heater of yours, very, very inefficient, stick in a heat pump water heater, and the cost of that would be in Hawaii over $3,000. And immediately the homeowner is going to say, I do not have $3,000 just sitting around to do this wonderful thing. So there's something called an instant rebate, where if you agree to install this, the government writes you a check. In, in essence, it's not quite that simple. On the spot for $3,000. So you're getting a free heat pump water heater, and your utility bill is going to drop like a rock. Does that sound like a good uh, climate justice? And this, this is confined only to uh, people, the AAMI average medium income, I think of uh, one or one percent or, or less. You have to be below the, the average income in order to qualify for this. Does that sound like a good uh, climate justice initiative? And you multiply that by thousands of homes, and you've got some real savings there. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I think it's clear there's kind of a correlation between initiatives that take on that effort of redistributing the wealth while simultaneously um, leveraging those practices to um, combat climate change. So for sure, that sounds like a fantastic your, initiative. Your, your fossil fuel use will go way, way, way down. Yeah. That actually wraps up our section on climate justice legislation. But another important area of climate justice we talked about and touched upon a little earlier is that of fighting climate change in the courts. Mm -hmm. So we saw this, for instance, in the Navajina versus Hawaii Department of Transportation trial, which featured 14 youth plaintiffs. Um, fighting for their right to a, quote, healthful environment. And so it's interesting. We were talking to, I think, now retired Supreme Court, Hawaii State Supreme Court Justice Michael Wilson, and he's talking about how efforts to combat climate change nowadays don't always have to go through the legislature, but also in our courts, in our, in our judicial system. Mm -hmm. So even at a technical level, the word climate justice can mean a lot. Mm -hmm. Howard, what do you think about um, the possibility of fighting climate justice, not through legislation, but in the courts? Uh, that would be fine. The, the instances I've heard about have to do with um, pollution and the fact that people in lower income neighborhoods usually live in dirtier environments with more pollution in the air. And that has its effect on more sickness in these lower income communities. And these are exactly the people who cannot afford to be sick and pay uh, doc doctor's bills. So that's definitely uh, one instance. And I'm wondering, this was Department of Transportation. How did transportation uh, get, get mixed in here? Yes, I believe it was, um, they were suing the Department of Transportation for the pollution caused by their systems. And I think that 
the kind of although yes it was like a i think it was a very symbolic and uh like a show of um how, i guess how far we could push the um the court system and just um push um climate justice further i think there was a couple other instances um in a couple other uh uh, states that um, try to do the same thing. So I think we're hoping that more will pop around, pop up um, around the country and around the globe and um, that kind of awareness around it will also um, help to make, I guess, governments change their mindsets and other orga organizations think more um, green, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On a specific note, I think what the youth plaintiffs pointed out is the series of Aloha Plus goals set for the year 2030. They argued that uh, the Hawaii Department of Transportation specifically is not on track to reach those goals. So mm -hmm. we're hoping to see some progress there. Would this be uh, referring to electric buses or? Partly. I think that's one of the core initiatives alongside the, inside the transportation system currently is shifting towards uh, renewable energy uh, in their bus system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that there's at least one electric bus out there. there the inauguration of it was uh, right outside of our uh, office in, in downtown uh, Honolulu. And another <clears throat> transportation equity situation is indeed in our uh, bus system where some of us feel that the bus you, you know when you get on the bus you have to pay for it and if the bus system were free and if the rail system were free this would incentivize low income people to go out of their way to use the the bus and 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 the rail uh, is that uh, possibly a good idea? There's other uh, systems worldwide who charge either little or nothing for uh, writing public transportation. And the main way that uh, we middle-class citizens do cause pollution and do use energy is uh, via our cars with one, one person in, in the car. Absolutely. In fact, I was in Japan and Switzerland this summer. Mm. Both countries have incredibly robust transportation systems, and they consider it their main means of transportation at that point. So mm -hmm. it's interesting how the more we invest into public transportation, the better it is for our environment. Yeah, and that also involves more walking. You have to walk to the bus stop, from the bus stop, and so forth. And guess what? Walking is great exercise. Yeah, when uh, I was a kid here in Honolulu, we had an electric bus system on uh, trolleys. They had, there was electric lines up above, and the bus was connected to them. And uh, the I think it was the automobile industry who said, no, nah, that's, that's too good. So we no, no longer have that. And Switzerland, Japan, yeah, two of the best, best, best countries for, for public transportation. And if you look at the energy use index for the average American versus the average Swiss or the average uh, Japanese, you will find that we are usually about double. We use each one of us uses about twice as much energy as the average citizen in those countries, and they have the sta same standard of living that, that we do. That's a good uh, good indicator. And finally, well, let's see, we need to wrap up. Do you have any final words of uh, great, great wisdom? Well, I think, Howard, we'd just like to thank you for offering us the chance to speak, especially as youth. It's not often that we get this opportunity to share our voices and uh, what we uh, discovered throughout the forum. Mm -hmm. Oh, and final note, uh, what is in the future? climate-wise for, for you two? Well, we're both off to college next year. Hopefully, we'll mm -hmm. get involved in climate activism there. I'm certainly mm -hmm. hoping to uh, continue working with youth organizations. I really like mm -hmm. kind of being a part of that band of youth to stand up for ourselves and what we believe in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in any given city, you will find that there's a concentration of green 
And that concentration of green, as in green culture, centers right around college campuses. You, you are the, the optimistic, dynamic, driven people. And mostly the, uh, the colleges very much encourage that because the professors are educated people. They know that climate change is the 800-pound uh, gorilla. And they want to For encourage sure. you to, to get after it with, with activism. Yeah, I think we also hope to stay like still involved with Hawaii climate change politics and legislation as well, though, because I think Hawaii has started to be the kind of leader in that area. And we want to, I think, encourage other states to do so. And I think by staying involved in all, in all wherever we are would be really great for us. Yeah. That's and thank you for having us. Yeah. Yes, that's something that gives me satisfaction is Hawaii was the first state in the nation to declare the goal of zero net energy, where on average, we will not be using any, any fossil fuel energy within 25 years, very ambitious. So on that very, very cheery note, we must bid fond adieu. Reina and Mira, thank you so much and take the leadership role and run with it. That's all from Think Tech Hawaii, Howard Wig. See you next time. If you liked this show, why don't you give us a like or subscribe to our channel? Thanks so much.